Yep. Okay. Uh, this is just, this is kind of a interesting uh, anomaly uh, that we'd never seen exactly. Um, so, and I don't, I don't remember exactly what the history was, but this, uh, this is a interesting uh, anomaly here of the, just clear this message. Um, there's a abnormal connection here um, between the, um, if you follow this pulmonary, the left superior pulmonary vein, um, and it seems like it's, uh, it's connecting directly with um, this structure, which is, as you would expect, is the coronary sinus. Um, and then you can, yeah, so, so there's a, so we've seen uh, unroofed coronary sinuses before, but this just seems, it seems like it's kind of the same thing uh, where there's a communication between the um, coronary sinus and the left atrium, but it's not directly connected to the left atrium, but to the um, superior pulmonary vein here. So it just kind of was a variant we'd never seen before. Have you seen anything like that, Jeff? No, that's that's cool. It's almost like, oh, I'm trying to, I mean, I guess it's just a can you scroll up higher? anomalous drainage. Yeah, can you scroll up higher? Keep going up. Higher? Yeah. Higher. Okay. And keep going, and then go down. So where's the regular? So this is the pulmonary vein here. And um, yeah, I'm just trying to see. Seems like right there is the. Um, to me, this is like an unroofed coronary sinus because it's basically a communication between the um, sinus and the um, left atrium, but not yeah, directly. I can show the coronal. Yeah. And, and flow is, I, I guess you're not, are you going to do an MR? I'm guessing flow is going from the left atrium through the coronary uh, sinus. So it's the left to right shunt, I'm guessing. That's an interesting. Yeah, I think it would be left to right, yeah. But not only are you getting coronary sinus flow, you're going to get pulmonary venous flow as well. So it's that's interesting. Look at that. Yeah, I've never I, I've not seen that before. Well, it might be it might be left it might be left to right, right? Because you have oxygenated blood here. You know, it's going to be left to right. No, no, I'm just saying I, I you're going to get not only coronary sinus. Um, not even going to get blood blood from the left atrium. You're also going to get blood from the left superior pulmonary vein directly yeah. into that as well. So it's a little bit of a bigger shunt. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This coronal shows it better. Uh, here you can see it. But the patient's older, right? I mean, it looks like an athlete. I mean, they in the heart isn't that big. That's interesting. Yeah, the the, the ventricles aren't big, but I thought the atrium was kind yeah, of. They, but, yeah, but the ventricles. I don't, I don't know the age. Uh, this case was shown, shown to me by uh, Art Stillman. Yeah, no, they just have atherosclerotic disease. They're not a yeah, yeah not, they're a, they're not a young kid. Right yeah, that's interesting. I have not seen that variant before. Okay, uh, so just go to the next one here. Uh, this case, uh, this gentleman, middle aged, um, he has a. He has history of cirrhosis and he has a liver and kidney transplant. And um, this was um, this was from October 19th. Um, he was admitted in an outside hospital, and then you can see all these liver um, um, low attenuation lesions here. They were biopsied and they got diffused B cells. This is B cells. So this is a post transplant uh, PTLD lymphoproliferative disorder, and he was admitted to an outside hospital. He was treated there, and then um about a few weeks later um at the outside hospital uh again you can see the um, hypodensities there ptld um at the outside hospital they uh scan this and they there's a new opacity here um they thought this was a they, i don't know they read this as a cavity or abscess which we didn't really once he was admitted to our place we looked at their imaging here we didn't i didn't really agree with with that, it looks like a, uh, it looks like uh, he has infectious symptoms, but this looks like a very kind of a well circumscribed uh, non-segmental consolidation, almost like a round pneumonia 
uh, look. The organizing pneumonia could also look like that with the reverse halo look, but he had, I mean, obviously with the transplant patient uh, and clinically he was infected. So this would be a, a, um, an infection. So um, it, looks, it looks like a bird's nest in mucor. I mean, I would yeah, definitely that's, have that's actually the first thing I thought about when I got shown this. Um, so um, I, I was really worried about fungal uh, pneumonia. And then um, a few days later, um, this, so let me just put them side by side. So yeah, so this is a, um, November 10th and then November, um, November 17th. So it went from this uh, you know, low bar, unilateral, you know, well-circumscribed, non-segmental um, consolidation to this bilateral patchy consolidation. Uh, uh, this ended up being uh, cultures grew Legionella Pneumophila, and then um, also urine antigen was positive. So this is kind of a classic uh, look for that. Um, uh, one of the things they talk about in textbooks is how um, it starts off as a uh, almost some, a lot, sometimes even a round, round pneumonia look you, uh, in a single lobe, and then in a matter of a few days, it'll uh, very rapidly progress to a multifocal um, consolidation. And uh, it's unclear if this is nos nosocomial or from the community, which Legionella, you can have both uh, you can get it either from a hospital. This guy was um, admitted for his uh, PTLD. And um, oh, this one I skipped over. This is a guy with uh, just kind of interesting case of COVID. Um, so this is a COVID pneumonia, multifocal uh, patchy consolidation. He had a, he has a P, uh, this is for PE. So he has a little P right there. Um, but the interesting thing was the cardiac findings. So very dilated LV. Uh, you can see a big thrombus here. And then as you get down, even bigger thrombus in the inferior wall here with the large aneurysm. So there's a large inferior wall um, transmural infarct with aneurysm. I mean, almost certainly infarct here in the apex aneurysm there. Um, and I just included two of the um, uh, long TI. Uh, images of the uh, CMR just to show the aneurysm, but you, can, you should be able to make a diagnosis off the CT of what that is. Not actually sure why they ordered the MRI, um, but it did confirm there's transmural infarct. So there's also an infarct of the RV. So, um, so it seems like this gentleman just um, has a very bad uh, uh, thrombotic uh, uh, state from COVID and developed uh, not only PEs, but probably um, had a plaque rupture in his coronary and multiple coronaries. And um, on top of that, from hypokinesis was very quick to form um, a large uh, thrombus in his ventricle. So really bad uh, complications. How, uh, how old is this guy? Uh, he was, uh, he is, he was born in 1960, so uh, 50. Yeah, I don't know if the etiology would be the same as plaque rupture. I, I don't know if it's the COVID-related vascular injury is the same as um, like an atherosclerotic rupture. I yeah, mean, I, I I don't I don't know. It could be. Yeah, yeah you're right. It might it might be some kind of vasculopathy and then just thrombus yeah. formation everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Not necessarily be um, CAD, but just Peter, uh, Peter, can you see his coronary arteries uh, at all? Yeah, you, you not great. I, I I was he has a little bit of plaque, uh, but uh, not not very good. You couldn't really. Um, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. I've seen that, but that's pretty. Uh, pretty yeah, this is the biggest uh, aneurysm I've seen in the inferior wall. 
see where. So you don't get a very good look at his LED there. Um, just not a good quality. And I have one more. Before you move on, could I ask a question? Um, yes. Regarding, this is just a more general question about the lungs. Are you guys seeing a lot of that really dense consolidation in COVID pneumonia? I'm not seeing a lot of that really dense consolidation. And I guess I wonder sometimes, you know, at what point would you raise the possibility of a secondary infection? Um, um. And I don't know whether this dense consolidation, you know, I mean, obviously this guy has like this whole thrombotic state going on, you know, yeah. so his COVID is not your typical, not your run um, of the mill. Like we've, we've had very little um, yeah. thrombotic disease in our COVID patients and, and not a lot of CT. So I guess I don't, that's what I'm asking for what you guys' experience. The patients, the patients that are admitted that have, we see a lot of this denser stuff in the patients that get admitted to the, um, ICUs and we follow them over the course and obviously once they're admitted to the ICU um, there's a very high chance they could have a all kinds of uh, nosocomial superimposed infections then it later associated pneumonias I don't know if this guy has something like that but this is something we see with COVID a lot at least me is I could see this you see how the airways are slightly um, dilated right there where the consolidation is and um, but yeah, I don't think I can say definitively. He might ha he might have a superimposed uh, hospital. Yeah, in the right lower lobe, that really dense consolidation seems more than what I would. Yeah, yeah. Say. Usually, when you start it starts off more uh, more ground glass than that. Almost yeah. typical. Uh, crazy paving type kind of look. Mm -hmm. but. Okay. This was, uh, and I don't have all the uh, images because there's to, to, to tell the whole story of this patient, but he's a gentleman that had a uh, squamous cell cancer, and I think it was in his uh, tongue. And then, but basically, the important thing is that uh, uh, he, they typically uh, biopsy uh, a bunch of lymph nodes along the cervical chains for any, uh, just to work these cancers up. And um, what happened is that they, um, and they're lymph node bad the lymph nodes came back negative for uh squamous cell um there's benign lymph nodes but they uh, he happened to have a, a higher riding um uh thoracic uh, duct and then they injured that um when they were when one of the biopsies and so he has a big uh leak bio uh, ky uh kylos here uh basically leak um in his neck as you can see and uh, this is a, these are kylos effusions um here and so they uh, they did two and actually over the matter of a few the next few months they did at least two ang lymph angiograms and they tried to ligate and this is just one image of static image but they tried they uh, try to repair it and they've ligated the uh, uh, the thoracic duct and you can see the leak here and where the thoracic duct is injured and then this is an interesting CT of the chest a few days post um, one of the lymph angiograms um so you can see the ligated duct here thoracic duct um probably the these effusions are still chylus effusions um and you can see these linear hyper hyper attenuating um lines here in the in both long in this long and then here you have the pleural effusion and then you can see them also here dependently so this is um embolized uh, lipiodol um, within the pulmonary capillaries, which which you can get um, following lymphangiograms. Um, um, and it's usually not a not a big deal. It can be problematic if um, the patient has a shunt, uh, intracardiac shunt, um, because you can get deposits in the brain, which can cause um, uh, kinds of neurogenic problems neurologic defects and uh, seizures. So, that's all I have. All right, thanks, Peter, those were great.
All right, who else on has some cases? I got cases. All right. All right, uh, ooh, that's big. I don't know why that's, sorry, that the little GoTo meeting is projecting over half my screen. Um, it mm, looks good here, it looks perfect. Yeah, super. Uh, <laughs> so this is a guy who came in actually yesterday and a uh, middle-aged guy. And I think if most of us saw this pattern of um, fibrosis, and there is some fibrosis, you can see the airways are bronchiectatic. They've been like this for a bit. Uh, more peri, you know, peribronchiolar fibrosis. Uh, I, I think it kind of has more of a pretty classic NSIP pattern. I mean, I'm sure there's some areas of organizing pneumonia here. What's interesting about this case is, and um, I don't know if I've seen this so acutely with drug toxicity, but just going backwards in time. So this last study was uh, yesterday, and now we're going like a few, like a couple months before. And if you go back in time, you're going to see over this time that there's more ground glass as we head backwards. Um, fibrosis is um, maybe a little less in terms of these airways. Yeah, they're still a little pulled apart, but not as bad as they were. Um, and we're just keep going back, and you'll see that when we get to the initial study where this all started, that this was a really classic organizing pneumonia, very peribronchiolar. And I can't remember which immunologic therapy he started um, a few weeks prior to this coming in for this CT. Uh, I can't remember if it was Gleevec or so, I, I just can't remember. Um, but this was a nice case of um, a patient having a drug induced, and they kept him on. This is now a few weeks later where they kept him on the drug because he had such a positive response, but he, and he was relatively asymptomatic. Um, and then because of the progression of the lung findings, uh, they started uh, taking him off and uh, treating him with steroids, but the lung injury was there and kind of now progressed to a, what I think would be, most people will call it an SIP pattern. And I, and I think I've shown a couple of these cases over the years most commonly with collagen vascular diseases, where you have a classic OP leading to an NSIP. Um, but I, I think it's the first time I've seen that with drug toxicity. So you said, Seth, this was immunotherapy? Yeah, this is immunotherapy. I have to find, I would have to check which one it was, but I looked at it and he started it um, just a few, like week or so before the CT. But he had such a dramatic response to his metastatic cancer that they, they kept him on it for a while because because he was asymptomatic and there I, I would have to look up the whole um, drug toxicity when you when you actually take someone off of it but I know symptom symptoms are a big factor but you can see here uh, in these airways that later on are pulled apart yeah some mild distortion but nothing as severe as when you get to kind of and again this is not that severe it's not a horrendous um, injury. He's he's overall doing fine, but just a nice example. Um, this is. I'll just pull up this this case because the last one takes a little bit longer to get through. Uh, again, I'm sorry that half my screen is taken up by the. Uh, so here's a guy who had a. Let's just go to a coronal real quick. Um, he had a hepatocellular carcinoma, and I'm just going to show you the uh, coronals very quickly. Uh, not the tumor is somewhere up here at the dome, uh, but the important thing is we can see that the diaphragm looks hunky dory there. Yeah, there's some subcapsular, you know, or uh, subdiaphragmatic fat and some mesenteric fat, but it looks kosher. Um, Then he undergoes, for the hepatocellular carcinoma, he undergoes a um, microwave ablation. And let me get rid of this. And I, I didn't realize this, but after reading up about it, I, I guess it's really a no-no to do any sort of microwave ablation when the lesion is this close to the dome of the diaphragm. Um, and you can see here, these are three separate passes uh, at 
different times. Uh, you can see needle here, needle here. So they do multiple treatments. So they did multiple treatments. They're going right through the diaphragm uh, on each of these. Um, they're radi they're doing micro, sorry, this is a microwave ablation. You can see the lapidol. And then I read a study a few months later, um, and this was, I think I just read this yesterday. And uh, I, I don't know if the effusion is related, I doubt it, but started noticing that there's a lot of fat here, demitus fat stuck up here. Uh, there's your treated lesion. Um, and if you go on the coronals, you can see that right by where they treated that lesion, that diaphragm is no longer intact, that there's a big gaping. So here it's intact, and then there's just a big gaping hole in that diaphragm and all that mesenteric slash omental fat, I guess it's really mesenteric fat, is kind of herniating up into the uh, right hemithorax. So this is a um, basically a diaphragmatic injury, rupture, whatever you want to call it, iatrogenic secondary to microwave ablation. And I looked up a paper because I, I sent it to our head of IR and say, hey, you may want to do a, you know, look at this case and maybe do a M and M with your guys. Um, this probably doesn't have is not a huge deal, but um, you know, I, I just looked up a couple of quick papers and it. This is seen if you do like microwave ablations by the dome. Uh, you get a nice shot of the discontinuity. This happens in like 20% of patients. So it's really recommended that you don't treat these at the dome with with microwave ablation. So, anyways, I had not seen that before. Seth, was there anything in the literature about other techniques like uh, cryotherapy? I no, I just you know what I didn't look. I just okay. looked up microwave, um, mm -hmm. and there weren't that many papers, and they weren't in prestigious journals. But they all had there was a ton of case reports, and the one. Um, it was a center, I can't remember where it was, that did a lot of them and they had like 40 cases of um, lesions at the dome treated with microwave ablation and like 21.6% or some number had diaphragmatic tears after um, therapy. So okay. they recommend not to do it and, I, and I'm sure. I think um, the issue though is that they don't really have a lot of options. I used to do a lot of liver transplant stuff. They don't have a lot of options and sometimes they're just trying to buy time for. Um, right. I, and, and, you know, as you say, I mean, I've seen this before, too, and, you know, this is kind of a more dramatic one than I've seen before, but I think sometimes there's a complex risk-benefit. Yeah, but I think the point being is maybe there was another way of treating them or another uh, ablation therapy that maybe not. Um, there, aren't, there aren't that many options, really, <laughs> and particularly in a particular center, there aren't always. These are tough patients. And then the last case, I think, is a really nice um, just teaching point. Um, let me see the best way to do this case, because this has a lot of different studies. So let me pull over the um, CTs first. And then we can go to, so this is a case of, let me go to the first study. Um, so let me just open this in 3D, if it will let me. So this is a guy, oh, it won't let me, okay, that's fine. Um, who has, um, was diagnosed a long time ago with a um, sacral chordoma. He's an older gentleman. It was treated. Um, he didn't have any real issues. It was kind of thought to be cured. And he presented with uh, one day a couple months ago with multiple PEs. And, you know, they're not subtle. We can see that there's multiple PEs all around here. Um, you know, segmental and subsegmental PEs here, here. So they treated him with um, anticoagulation, uh, you know, we have a pretty big center here for PE stuff. So he was on therapy, he was treated appropriately. Um, and these PEs never went away. And in fact, if you 
look at some of them, maybe some of them are creeping and crawling even actually more central, um, especially in this left upper lobe. But I, I, understandably, I think uh, people just said hey, it's just PE, hasn't been treated long enough, it's only been a couple of weeks. Uh, here is his, um, I have some MR imaging as well, of his uh, sacral chordoma um, and showing, I think this shows it, oh no, this is a later study. I have the MR showing the tumor, but you can see there's this mass in the right atrium, a mass in the IVC. Uh, additionally, which I'll pull up in a second, there was clear um, uh, what looked like tumor or thrombus in the uh, iliac veins and in the inferior vena cava. Now, what's interesting is he came back now, this is a few days after the CT, and his PEs are, again, he's still been on treatment. Um, and this just was read as worsening acute pulmonary emboli. But what's interesting is you notice that if you go back to the old studies, that most of these emboli are in the same kind of distribution as the old study. Um, these vessels are quite distended. Here's this left upper lobe one before that was um, kind of back here, you can see, and has continued to crawl centrally. And now we have a larger right atrial mass. And this was called, you know, PE and likely um, right atrial thrombus. And he underwent an MRI, um, which, you know, just goes to show what happens when you have a study that's not well performed. Um, and, you know, just shows the importance of having good uh, MR techs. And whoop, that's not what I wanted to show. Sorry, guys. So let's just um, see if I can pull this up. Um, or is that going to crash my system? So what this is going to show is that on the MRI, this looks like all looks like clot. The issue is that the technologist didn't follow our protocol, didn't call anyone to uh, review the studies, didn't do the perfusion appropriately. Um, so, let me see if I can just. Here is the uh, he did the, you know a good way to differentiate between clot. And uh, so here it is on T2. It's quite bright on T2, which is not, um, you can see clot that's quite bright on T2. I, I don't find that a little bit too, a little bit bright for me, but still that's not unheard of. What I wanna show is that, you know, why they called it clot was that this is the, perform the uh, delayed enhancement using a uh, inversion time of, Six. I don't know why they did, they did 800. Normally you do 600, but I guess it doesn't matter. The concept is that the clot has, um, you know, has a pretty long inversion time, and thus when you pull out the, uh, or has a pretty long um, native inherent uh, T1 relax relaxivity, and it doesn't uptake take up contrast. So when you do your, uh, you know, delayed enhancement imaging. Um, you know, normal soft tissue or tumor, depending on how much GAD it has, will know anywhere from, I don't know, 150 to 300, uh, depending on how much GAD it takes up, sometimes even more or earlier. But the concept is that thrombus, when you pull, go out way much longer on your TI, like 600, 800, it'll appear quite dark, whereas the normal myocardium appears gray. Now, that concept is great and works if the technologists do this appropriately. This was done actually immediately after the uh, perfusion imaging, which is not our protocol. So our protocol is to do the perfusion imaging, wait a little bit, then do the T1 post, and then wait your full eight to 10 minutes and do your uh, TIs at 300 or whatever the normal null time of myocardium in 600. So they saw this, didn't realize that the technologist had done this and read this as clot. Uh, long story short is, um, based on the CT findings, and then all of them also pulling all this stuff out of the IVC, this was all tumor. Um, so this was all tumor thrombus um, that had, or tumor that had gone from the IVC uh, up into the, um, from the chordoma up into the uh, right heart and had, and right atrium, 
uh, and had embolized into the pulmonary arteries, hence the increasing size despite anticoagulation. But it was just a false negative on MRI because it just wasn't, you know, done properly. So just an, I, I thought that was a very good teaching case and a very kind of subtle example of looking back at each study and recognizing that this isn't a new acute PE probably, that this is tumor. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like that case. Cool, thanks but, for sharing. No, that's it. All right, anyone else have cases before I go? Okay, well, hopefully my screen will work this week. Good, you should all see my screen. Um, I got some interesting cases this week. Let's start with this one. So this is a 26 year old female. And Seth, I'll be curious, and David, Peter, what you guys think of this. So. The diagnosis I don't think is in question. She's got um, this big mass here in the mesotime. It's densely calcified. She's got a, a thrombosed or nearly thrombosed SVC, a lot of venous collaterals. You can see big internal mammary, a bunch of mediastinal veins here. Um, and then dilated azagus, hemiazagus, and a bunch of calcifications in her lungs, nodules, and then some a lot of collaterals here along the diaphragm. So this is a case of fibrosing mediastinitis. It's seems very focal in this case around the SVC with some SVC obstruction. And what's interesting, and I don't have any post-op imaging other than a radiograph that doesn't really help, is they um, actually went in and, and resected this, which I've never seen done, and rebuilt the SVC with a graft. Um, so that's the thing that I thought was interesting is, you know, we see, we see a, not a, a ton of fibrosis mucinitis, it's not that common, but we see a case or two a year, and usually by the time patients get to us, they already have venous stenosis, airway narrowing, uh, arterial narrowing. You can see the upper lobe pulmonary artery is suffering, and, but the veins themselves are open. So uh, the very focal, and I'm guessing because of all the collaterals and the SVC obstruction, that was the impetus to repair this. But I've never seen anyone actually go in there, at least successfully, and try to re remove the, the fibrotic mass and rebuild whatever's injured from it i've never I, I would love to see the path all or a gross of that I, i've never seen that they all you know they always said you don't touch these it's right like it's usually hard as a rock and everything's stuck down yeah. that's fascinating and they, they actually say that doing the surgery makes it worse because um there's this rebound of even more exaggerated fibrosis so it's really should be left untouched yeah I've seen some people get treated, I think, with rituximab. So I, I didn't, I didn't know if they were planning on adjuvant sort of rituximab therapy, but um, with the thought that you could suppress the immune response. But yeah, I mean, like I said, this one was pretty limited to the SVC, but there's plenty of collateral, so it's not like it's an acute SVC syndrome or anything. And then I have a neat companion case for it. Um, so this is another patient. Um, Jeff, you didn't. Have a follow-up study on that last one to show a nice patent reconstructed no, case. I mean, that's the, the I don't have a post-op CT. It would be nice if I did. I may get one in the future, but there's really Super. no legitimate reason to do one right now. So here's a companion case. This is another young patient with this mediastinal problem. You can see this this is much more confluent soft tissue kind of inter, interposing around all the vessels. There are some calcified lymph nodes with milk of calcium in them. Um, and this patient has known sarcoidosis. This was, um, this is billed as a fibrosis mesotonitis, which I guess it sort of is. Um, but to me, it didn't have the, the big, soft, dense mass that we typically see. And the fact that so many of these vessels were open, you'd expect fibrosis mesotonitis to have taken out these vessels. There's some mild mass effect, but um, not like this left upper lobe pulmonary artery there, but not like we see with the typical histo base. And so uh, this was actually, uh, they did a transbronc, and this is all granulomatous, uh, non-caseating granulomatous. So this is sarcoid uh, with a fibrosing mediastinitis. And you can see there's a bunch of lung nodules. And a lot of this is inflammatory too. You can see there's airway problems going on. But there are some perilymphatic nodules and peri peribronchial thickening. And this was done elsewhere. Um, but what's kind of cool is they did the, they had a, this is a, a spectral CT or dual energy CT. And you can see the perfusion defects um, 
from the, the obstruction in that left upper lobe particular that I pointed out with pretty decent perfusion elsewhere, a little bit of a problem in the middle lobe. Um, doesn't really change anything, but you know, sarcoid has been described as a cause of so-called fibrosis tinnitus. I think this is like the second case I've seen. More often, you just get confluent lymphoid tissue that uh, most commonly causes venous stenosis. There's definitely some mass effect, but a lot less than you see with the typical histoplasmosis, where everything just gets taken out. It's hard as a rock. Yeah, I've only seen one, one case of this, but we do get about once a year or maybe twice a year a case from the outside that's sent to us as CTEF because they get a PQ scan, um, which shows these defects. And then who knows who's reading the CT, but they say, you know, vascular obstruction to the CTEF and it's sent to us for evaluation. And, mm -hmm. uh, this is really impressive. I, I've yeah, that's kind so, of so you know, sarcoids on the list for GFM, uh, granulomas, uh, fibrosing medius tenitis, and I'd shown a case I think a year or two ago of a young man that had bilateral pulmonary venous, um, you know, constrictions caused by sarcoid, and um, he end, ended up getting stents in his um, pulmonary veins. But he had, um, you know, he had pulmonary hypertension. Things were really backing up dramatically in this mm -hmm. young guy. Yeah, and it's unclear to me if any of this will respond to corticosteroids or not. I mean, if there's active granulomatous inflammation, one would think so, or you know, or maybe a methotrexate or something else that they sometimes use. Okay, so that was that one. Um, this is kind of a some kind of an interesting case. I don't think I've seen this, and this was, I think, a good observation. Uh, done. So this patient was getting a hemodialysis catheter placed in the cath lab. Um, I'm guessing by nephrology, and so uh, they were. This was their initial. They were just. There's, there's another line in, but they were coming from a left IJ approach, and you can see that's their initial imaging study. And there seems to be. I couldn't find the the exact one, but I'll show you already. There's some funny looking contrast there and there. And if you see this injection, you see there's a little fill here, and I can't. I, I'm wondering if some of this is running along the uh, the heart and mediastinum rather than in it, because it's kind of backflowing. But uh, they were worried that they had perforated the SVC. The catheter looks like it's appropriately placed on this image. So um, they sent the patient for a CT scan, and you can see. Um, so that's the right IJ that's been in. Um, let's see where here we come in. Is this the right CT scan? Uh, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. I think I grabbed the wrong CT scan, but you can see there's a contrast in the pleural space. Um, but yeah, so they this was a um, they ended up actually going through into the um, right pleural space. So this is a pleurogram um, there. I'll have to get the other CT out. I thought I grabbed the right one, but um, you know we see we see lines occasionally go wrong, um, especially when they're done at the bedside. But this was done under fluoro, but. Uh, seeing that contrast spilling out as they were doing the procedure uh, was a good observation. And then just managed conservatively because of the low pressure. They just carefully backed out the line, and then uh, this will resorb over time. But I don't, yeah, I'm sorry I don't have the right CT for it, but um, a little iatrogenosis there. This is kind of a cool case. I'm curious what you guys think. So this was a um, an ILD case referred to us with a diagnosis of NSIP. I don't know what in the world that was based on. Um, no biopsy, no connective tissue disease that I'm aware of. Um, but here's the CT scan. And you can see there's already a lot of, the, the crine is almost in a coronal plane axially. So there's a lot of upper lobe distortion, volume loss, a lot of funny looking airways. It almost has that little bit of corrugated appearance we see with Mounier Kuhn, but they're really not dilated, at least the trachea, as I measured it, like 28 in true cross section. But there is bronchiectasis centrally. And then we have fibrosis in the lung periphery with traction bronchiectasis that is clearly an upper zone predominant process. And I thought, especially in the apex, it's getting kind of thick up in here. Uh, I can show you on a soft tissue window. There's a little bit more tissue than I typically like to see up there. And then on the coronal, uh, same deal. You can see this um, distortion and sort of this peri peripheral thickening, marked upper lobe volume loss. And then they did the outside scan also had some minips that just show those nicely dilated airways. So I think this is pri probably, it's either PPFE by itself or it's mixed with some other pattern, but clearly an upper zone predominant. And I think there's a secondary, uh, a separate airway process that's caused, and it may be because of this, but 
primary airway uh, abnormality that, that's reminiscent of Mounier Kuhn without the tracheobronchomegaly. I'm curious if you guys would agree with that. I'm, I'm presuming there's some undefined connective tissue disease or something. I, mean, uh, I presume, and I think we'll probably be seeing this patient for ILD evaluation, but I would not call this NSIP. No. How old is this patient? Out of curiosity. Um, I can tell you. Uh, 73. When do you stop calling PPFE? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> well, I rarely no. call it, so it's not like when I stop, it's when I actually do. Um, no, no. I have like eight, you know, you see like these 85 year olds with this, you know, heaped up upper lobe fibrosis with pleural thickening. And I'm yeah, like, but I typically don't. It, it doesn't, it, typically it kind of, it's just at the apices and it may, there may be some calcium. I just call it upper lobe scar, but the amount of traction bronchiectasis here to me is, is way too much. I'm not doubting, I'm not doubting this case. I, I'm yeah. just saying. Um, yeah, I, I was, what I was going with was that, yeah, if it's just a little bit at the apices, I don't get excited at all. But this patient actually has upper lobe volume loss, so that's when I would call it. You know, I have like an 84 or 85 year old yeah. that has it. Yeah, like, it looks like PPFE. Looks pretty good for it. Yeah, um, I think so. I've seen we've had a lot of distortion of the trachea. I've, I've got a couple of cases where we've had imaging going way back, like 10 years, and you can see everything lifting up and the um, the trachea getting almost, you know, sort of buckled as everything is lifted toward the apices. On the coronals, what's nice too, and is a described classic finding are those sort of triangular areas. See that sort of wedgy triangular mm -hmm. area? Yeah, absolutely. All dense fibrotic consolidation. Um, so to me, I would, I personally, I would just call, call it PPFE. But then the problem, of course, is like nobody wants to biopsy that to prove it, but. Well, and I don't think there's any reason to biopsy it because it's not going to change management. Yeah. Interestingly, um, these were mistaken as pleural plaques too, and I think David will agree with me. These are pseudo plaques. First of all, they're not on the pleural surface, and we don't see asbestos plaques at the apices. I think these are lifted off a little too much. Um, I think this is. Yeah. I, I think my question was more Phil. I mean, this right. is. Not it, it, it's like when do you call do you call UIP or IPF in a 95 year old with you know, <laughs> exactly fibrosis. Um, you know, when we see well, not? I mean, it's still a disease, right? I mean, I don't well, know not, that without not, making a diagnosis, yeah, unless yeah. unless at your institution that forces a procedure, which it really shouldn't. I mean, if I just saw a little bit, like, because that's what I was saying, is if I just see like something like this, I don't get excited about it. But the fact that there's volume yeah. loss tells me it's a lot more. This is coming down a little too much, even if we ignored the bases. Like, I would call this real, but if it was just like this stuff up here. I see that all the time and would probably ignore it, especially in an 85-year-old. Now, if I saw it in a younger person, it may be the beginning of something. But that's always so, a good question, is the spectrum of normal versus aging or... Jeff, that, yeah. uh, the, the trachea was buckled, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think some of that's distorted, but it, to me, it has, let me come back to it, it has that kind of corrugated look, you, I mean, just that sort of hyper, uh, I don't know what the word it is but it, it's it's not as smooth as normal it's not the the really bad Mounier coon where you almost see like a little out pouching but it's not just normal trachea to me it's not smooth enough so i wonder if there is an airways component so i mean there could be and especially if the person's been coughing a lot you know you can uh you can sort of stress the the tissues there but the other thing is with just with the traction in that yes. upper lung fibrosis mm -hmm. You know, you're exerting a lot of pull on the trachea, so you're going to expand the trachea wherever it can. Right. And the place to expand the most is between the cartilages, and that's why you get the corrugation. So I think it's it's explainable just as secondary traction okay. on the airway caused by this adjacent fibrosis. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, we see a lot of cases where you have bad sarcoid upper lobe fibrosis, and you get the same dilated pulled apart trachea. All right. Um, so awesome traction tracheopathy that's its new name because <laughs> it's not dilated so we can't call it tracheectasis we're going to call it tracheopathy okay let's, uh, cool. let's call it cany, cany trachea yeah i don't know if i want to be associated with bad tracheas okay so here's a, another cool case and this is a little bit similar to vasilios's case from i think it was last week or a few weeks ago so this patient, oh, I gotta remember the history, um, has, oh yes, has autoimmune thrombocytopenia, young patient in her 20s. And let me get the scans correct order. So this was her initial scan from uh, that shows these kind of stuff around the airways. You can see there's a bronchus there, it's thickened, there's some patchy ground glass opacities. I go down, 
will come in there. There's some more of these smudgy little nodules, but a lot of them are around airways. There's a bronchus there. Let me make it a little bigger so everybody can see. But you can see the subtle air bronchograms in a lot of these. Not every nodule, but many of them. There's an airway, and they're just kind of nodules. And so, in for whatever reasons, a follow-up was done about six, five months later. And I think there's definitely more of them. And you can see there's an airway. They're all almost all air peribronchial. So the question is, what are these? They're very well defined. Some have a little bit of ground glass component to them, but they're very discrete margins. But even this one, like for example, you can make out the airway in it. So I think this is again along that malt spectrum. We talked about follicular bronchiolitis, lymphoid hyperplasia. In other cases, these are again pretty airway centric. There's some along the the lymphatics as well. So there are associations of um, lymphoproliferation and autoimmune um, thrombocytopenia. So I don't know, but I think this is probably along the follicular bronchiolitis spectrum, if you are lymphoid hyperplasia related to uh, autoimmune disease. Anyone disagree or have a better idea? If you rule out infection, then I think that is probably the top choice. Yeah. They're all, they're so clean for infection, and the fact they've been going on for months, and right. I mean, it's just, it's and unusual. Have, yeah. But I suspect if you treat the autoimmune thrombocytopenia, this should hopefully respond as well. All right. So this so is... Your Urologists do a bronch, or what, what would they do to establish a diagnosis, or would they treat and see if it goes away? Uh, um, diagnosis? They would probably try a bronch. I'm not sure what they're going to get because um, they're pretty peripheral, mm -hmm. but they could at least do a BAL and look for a lymphocytosis or rule out an infection. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's the best we do. I don't think we would biopsy them because, especially with someone with ITP, it's not, not the safest procedure. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to yeah. really alter management much as far as like a surgical right. biopsy. All right, um, let's see. This is a cool case. Um, I showed it to Seth already, and Travis and Howard have seen it. So this is uh, an, a woman in her 70s, I believe. She's had a history of um, respiratory illness and many, many CTs going back that show findings suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. She's got big pulmonary arteries, and more importantly, a dilated right heart and a little bit of RV hypertrophy. Anyway, um, this was done somewhere else, and this was a new finding. And it, but we had an image her chest. I don't, at least I didn't have historical imaging for about over a year. Um, and for whatever reason, this was called a pulmonary artery dissection at St. Elsewhere, um, which I don't agree with in any form. Um, those are A, they're exceedingly rare and they're almost all either from blunt trauma or iatrogenosis and she did not have any procedures done. And also it just doesn't look like a dissection. This is all thrombus in this left pulmonary artery. The only other history I was able to dig up later was that she'd had radiation therapy to this area for a stage 2B. Well, they weren't sure if the pericardium was involved, so they treated her as a stage 2B non-small cell. So she got definitive chemo radiation about two years ago, has been free of any recurrent neoplasm and has not been on any treatment. No history of PE, but you can see she's got clearly right heart dilation. There's bowing of the interatrial septum. There's flattening of the interventricular septum. There's a little bit of RV hypertrophy here. So all good findings of pulmonary hypertension. And these are thick cuts too. Are they, why they do their PE studies at three millimeters is beyond me. Um, and But she has pretty good perfusion on the right. You see really nice uh, vessels there, but the left the left is clearly the problem area, and it kind of drops out out here. So the question is is you know, so I first of all I don't think it's a dissection at all. I don't think anybody does once we looked at it, but rather this is in situ thrombus. And then the question is is this is this CTAF? Do you treat it like CTAF? She's got pulmonary hypertension. It's presumably getting worse because compared to a, three, a study from three years ago, this right heart doesn't look as happy. I don't know if she's had a recent echo or right heart calf. And if so, is this something? Is it, you know, do you, is this a potential surgical treatment? Um, and or have you, have you guys, anyone ever seen just in situ thrombus developing? You know, maybe it's altered because of the radiation, and they're more prone to thrombus. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this. I, I've never seen in situ unilateral you know, this extensive on one side and absent on the other, and that's why I was thinking, you know, there are some vascular obstruction. Uh, segmental areas on the left, and I've seen we, we've seen some CTEF cases look like this, but um, it, it 
usually with the CTEP cases look like that there's more clear CTEP all over the place. Right. The, That's what, and, and, and two years ago, there was nothing. And she's had, yeah. pre, she's had pulmonary hypertension predating this. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's probably related to the radiation. I, I just never seen yeah. that before. And, um, and the question is, you know, you don't want to treat this in general. You don't treat this with an endarterectomy, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think you would just anticoagulate and manage yeah. her pressures as best you could. Okay. So, uh, why not treat with thrombectomy? Is there a contraindication? Uh, well, I don't know. We do a lot of them, and they will not touch these. Um, so I would have to find out exactly why they stay away from the uh, the um, PAH related um, thrombus versus the uh, CTEF, but uh, that's they're constantly asking us to differentiate um, because they don't want to touch these. Um, but I can find out why exactly what what it is about the procedure. So I mean, can they? It is obstructive, but I also think a lot of these get better with um, the stuff that's not. Uh, Kind of epithelialized will get better with uh, anticoagulation. Why is that vessel so distended? Do, do you think it had to be distended before the the thrombus formed, yeah, or, or the, did, um, does CTEP cause dilation? It was, or does I mean, only pulmonary hypertension cause dilation? Her pulmonary arteries were big to begin with, and um, but I think this one's bigger now. Uh, probably because of remodeling and recanalization would be my guess, because you see these little channels going through the clot. But, Jeff, can you show the um, left atrial appendage? Because it looks kind of... Kind of... Yeah. Is that just radiation damage right around the... That's what the I want, yeah, because they treat it for possible pericardial. So the radiation was all yeah. right in here. Yeah, so that region looks like it was just um, scarred up. Yeah, radiation. even the bronchus here looks, I mean, it just kind of looks narrowed and thick. And, and, and on old studies, yeah. this area has been kind of socked in for some time. Yeah, so I like the radiation yeah. injury to the vessel and then thrombus. Yeah, I've not, because originally it was they were going to treat it as a stage 1A, um, and then they ended up doing the adjuvant chemo, and I, they probably all adjusted their radiation field because of the pair. Was this... Um, SBRT or external beam? Uh, I don't know. I don't have records. I'm guessing it was it was either SBRT or IMRT given the the location. So Jeff, show us show us a long window. Let's look for some radiation scarring. It's this stuff in here. I think it was external. Don't you think? It looks like a there's looks like a straight line that's going. Yeah, there. but sometimes with the IMRT we see that depending on how they. They uh, adjust the beam. It's it's not as easy as it used to be. The, some of these treatment options, I mean, treatment fields are pretty uh, complex looking. But yeah, I agree. It does look straight there. But when the ones I've seen that are perihilar often have this appearance. It kind of as it evolves, it kind of sticks down towards the hilum. We've lost volume there. So this area's been out, but it's right. You know, it's right about where the not all the clot, but at least some of it was. So I wonder if it, 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 that was a contributing factor and. I mean, we don't have a lot of patients with bad pulmonary hypertension and radiation in the same area. So, and you can see the perfusion defect, just how it's hyper loosened up in there, just reduced flow of that upper lobe. Okay, um, let me show this. I can't remember if I've shown an example of this already. Um, I was looking and I didn't see one. Um, have you guys seen this artifact from the HeartMate 3? The, uh, the stripes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we used to see that a lot. Um, and I can't, I, there was a really neat explanation for it. So I, I looked into it. So the, the HeartMate 3, um, is a, um, it uses a magnetic, it's, it's, it works the equivalent of like the, uh, the maglev trains. So it, it's, I think it's a rapidly changing magnetic field that allows the motor to become pulsatile. Um, uh, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, but the HeartMate 2s, if I remember, were continuous flow. And the newer VADs allow for pulsatile uh, uh, pumping. And so it, because there's a magnetic field here, this is an artifact we see on our portable DR units. And you don't see it on every image, but most of them. The first time I saw it, I thought it was so perfectly oriented. I thought they were grid lines. And uh, I, I asked one of the techs to take a look. And they said, oh, no, no, we see that. So our physicists um, 
looked into this as well. And, and they said the easy fix for this would be using a thin piece of metal to make effectively like a little Faraday cage um, to fix this. But it's just one I, I, I've, I haven't seen it. I just recently saw one, and yet we've been using these for several years. So I don't know if there's something in the in the detectors or if there's, they've made a change to this. But um, if you go to the website for the company that makes this, it, it is a magnetic. Uh, it's a centra. A, what are they? I forget what they call it, centromag type uh, pump instead of a, uh, a, a a rotary pump. And I think it causes uh, allows faster switching of rotation speed so that you um, can have better um, emulate pulsatile blood flow. But something to be aware of, and this a, a simple little piece of metal may be a good fix with. So we're we're playing around right now. With our physicists see if we can come up with a little little like metal we put between the detector and the patient to see if we can uh, get rid of this artifact without compromising our image quality. But it's just kind of another one of those artifacts to be aware of. And it, it only doesn't seem I never saw it on old CR, so uh, I think it's just a DR artifact. All so, right, uh, Jeff. I used to see this with the earlier versions of the HeartMate, so it's not unique to the three. Oh, and you saw it with the twos. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to dig it out. What we, what the cases we had in the past. Okay, that would be great. Yeah, I, I'd never seen one before, and you know, we 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 do a fair amount of VAD, so I don't know if we just got lucky. Because um, I, I noticed on this patient there were some radiographs that did not have the artifact, and it does change. You can see it's almost perfectly. Uh, perpendicular to the, the the long axis of the pump, so where it was angled a different way, the, the the lines angled as well. So that's a one other clue that you're dealing with it. All right, well it is now three o'clock here, so I'll go ahead and stop and save the rest for next time. Uh, we're going to be off for the next two weeks because of the holidays, so we will talk to everyone in 2021. And everyone have a happy holiday. Thanks everyone. Thank you.